Please welcome back Paul Williams, the director. And Faye Ginsberg, thank you so much for being here and for doing this. Thank you so much for such an extraordinary film and amazing journey. And the credit roll tells you it's not just so much time that we see, but also so many collaborators on that film. So thank you so much. It's just an incredible gift. So um, I would like to start things off. I'm sure they're start getting your questions ready. Um, so I wonder if, we could, if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the film that we, some of the world of Kurumo and things he faced that we don't see. And um, because we, we understand from the beginning that he's passed away, but it's not clear to us as viewers what the, or audience members, what in fact was going on. And I know there, there are lots of issues of restrictions about what can be seen and heard in films coming from Aboriginal Australia. As we saw in the beginning, there are restrictions on who can see images of people who have died, for example. But I wonder if you are comfortable talking a little bit about what, what was going on in terms of his own life that you didn't talk about in the film, but um, led to, I mean, he died at age 46, which is obviously very young, so. Yeah. Um he and I were born in the same year. So, um, look, when we started the film, there was two provisos, um, that, that two stipulations that he made. Um, the first was that there were to be no interviews with him whatsoever, apart from that little one we snuck in at the very end. That's another story, quite a funny one. Um, about the pub, you mean? Uh, no, 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 about when, it, when he sort of says a little bit at the end over black. Um, um, you know, when he s ends it, when he says "you're lingua and that's all. All right. Um, so he he didn't want to be he didn't want to be interviewed. Um, so that was quite a quite a challenge. Like the the subject of your film um, won't won't be interviewed. So um, and the other one was uh, that he didn't want his ongoing health battles um, as to be included in the film in any way. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, uh, but the main one from his perspective, um, and you've got to remember that he was a co-producer of the film, um, was that there's enough to his mind, and to mine as well, um, that there's enough uh, documentation in Australia about the perilous state of uh, indigenous health or lack thereof, um, which is a, a, a big problem. Um, there's an initiative with the federal government called Close the Gap, which is looking at the uh, difference in life expectancy between indigenous non and non-indigenous Australians, and it's over 10 years for males and females. So it's not one or two years, 10 years, which is, Quite scandalous. Um, so yeah, he he didn't want that to be included um, because he wanted to con he wanted to concentrate on the cultural component. So I think the reason why the film was so successful in Australia um, in its uh, theatrical theatrical run was partly because it does that. Um, most films uh, that have an indigenous theme um, sort of look at um, look at indigenous life as a kind of amalgamation of um, of problems to be solved um, and he he wasn't really interested in representing the young world in that way but he was battling uh, health issues all his life. I mean, he's born without pupils, so um, born blind. But aside from that, he contracted um, hepatitis B in hospital when he was about eight. So he had ongoing uh, complications with that. Um, he hated, he hated um, anything to do with um, medicine and doctors and clinics and and and, and um, in the end he um, had like many many indigenous Australians have um, like um, 
very very severe uh, renal uh, problems. So he needed dialysis for the last. He needed it probably for the last five or six years of his life, but it was critical for the last 18 months and is what uh, is referred to as a non-compliant uh, patient, uh, which puts you on the bottom of a um, transplant, transplant list. So there's no way he was ever going to get a kidney transplant. Um, and in the end, he gave up on the treatment. That's my sort of opinion. Uh, so in the last 12 months of his life, he was uh, in ICU um, six times and medevaced from, from Alcohol Island uh, three times, including one time while we were shooting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I mean, you'll see also, I mean, the incredible, vibrant uh, vitality of people on Elko Island in their lives, but the stratification of medical care is very uh, part of what we don't see so much of and but, but yeah that, that, that's right and look it's one of those kind of things that it, it, so the film in a way doesn't uh, present a complete picture of aboriginality in australia but it was never in, in, in uh, it was never my intention and, and, and it's such a an enormous world um but the the unique thing about the film is is that it it, it, it shines a light on that part of um, indigenous culture that you just don't get to see. Like like Australians, the majority of Australians, myself included, before I started making the film. I mean, uh, who knew? Well, I, I, I did know that 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 this vibrant cultural practice that's unbroken for tens of thousands of years endures uh, and, and this is the strongest place in Australia in the Yungle world, not just Elka Island but um, um, the Gove Peninsula. Um, all, all across northern Australia. Yeah, and nor the, the northeast north, of the yeah. top end, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was the, uh, and I, I really make no apologies for that. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't mean to steer towards that because it's such a, a beautiful film with so much joy in it. Also the way he's, uh, incorporated so fully, um, as a blind person and as a participant, it's, you see with the singing, mm. you know, on Elko Island and during all the different rituals and ceremonies, mm. it's, you know, you see on the Western stages, he's there by himself and someone has to come assist him. He's just completely, like, everyone's body is next to him and it's very, um, you know, it's such a, a different kind of experience for, um, for a blind participant or musician because every sense is involved in a way that you don't see on Western stages where things are isolated. And yeah. so it's a lovely contrast to help us understand that part of his life as well. Right. And <clears throat> one sort of interesting part that... Um, I, I didn't really hone in on too much in the film, um, but I mean, it's, it's referenced. Um, his, the, the nickname, if you like, for, for Gurumo on the island um, was uh, Miltry, uh, which means blind boy or blind man. Uh, and it's an, a term of affection. Uh, and that's abbreviated, as is the case often in, in the Aboriginal kind of... Um, you, you have seven or eight names that you go by. It's amazing. Um, and so Midgey was the other one, which is like, you know, little blind, <laughs> little blind fella. Um, but it's just quite diminutive. Um, uh, um, so, you know, just a small, small kind of character. Um, and as Susan, his auntie, sort of says when he's kind of on the red carpet at the second Arias uh, ward, I mean, she was glad who was born blind. You know, she said it seems like a perverse thing to, to say because it's like without being able to see all the noise of modernity, um, you can actually concentrate on the ancient, you know, the, the traditional song lines which uh, was his great, great inheritance his great in cultural inheritance, probably better than anyone else. So um, talk about... Um, Flipping the script, yeah. yeah what, a, what a wonderful way of looking at the world. Yeah. She's such a wonderful presence in the film. Oh, indeed. Yeah. And a, a, just a beautiful, beautiful woman. 
Incredible. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're opening up, so get ready. Um, so I know there are sections in the, in the film where you've gone to black screen more than just the usual sort of cut for an edit or something. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that decision. Well, yeah. Um, look, it was, it was partly to address what I sort of perceived in a directorial sense um, as... Uh, he is such a highly functioning uh, person in the musical space that you lose, you, you actually lose uh, track that uh, he's living with a, a disability, um, that, that, that he's blind. And um, I kind of wanted the audience to check in with that um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a touchstone, I suppose, within the film. So. We started off on black. I mean, the reason I did that was it was a couple of reasons. One, so you actually get the uh, the experience of it, uh, and and so okay, this is going to be a film where audio is really really important. So you, so you've got his point of view, you've got his his world view, um, and also probably more importantly, uh, it sets up the idea that th this film is actually on his terms. So when we do that and you bank up with him being an unwilling participant um, in the, like the whole fame game, there was, this, there was a thing that made me laugh the other day. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Robert Smith, the singer of The Cure. Did anyone see that? Right. So this um, singer of this um, 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 English band that I love, The Cure, is being inducted into the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and um, there's this very sprightly, jumped up uh, interviewer saying, so, Robert, Robert, are you as excited as I am that you're being not, you know, that you're, today you're in the Rock and Roll uh, Hall of Fame and she's all giddy and uh, he goes, um, well, by the sounds of it, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so and I thought that's kind of like Gurumul light um, Gurumul just would have said nothing um, and well he probably wouldn't have turned up um, yeah so, so, so the darkness was there and um, um, the producer and editor Shannon and I were saying okay how long do we let that go for how long can we hold our nerve um, before people think there's something wrong with the projector it's very elegantly done and, and a very a wonderful reminder about that so thank you so um we have a, a person with a microphone, if uh, just to help keep us all hearing. So we've got a question up back, back there. Wait, 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 wait. No, what's the for the New Yorkers, they don't need microphones. Yeah. 30 seconds, I'll be there, don't worry. So other people What span of time did it require for you to film the, yeah. from the beginning of the story? To yeah, I, um, so I was um, on the project for four years. Um, but Skinny Fish had a box of archival tapes, a, a really big box of archival tapes, um, which weren't, uh, and, and some 16 mil and Super 8, and it was really just a kind of dream actually, um, but with no classification or labelling or kind of anything. So I had to kind of put, I had to, I had to make sense of their archive over, you know, probably 15 years. Um, yeah, so a lot of which we use in the film. So uh, they've been uh, documenting in a fairly um, sp sporadic way for for all the all the time they were working as a um, uh, as a lab. It was funny. I mean, they had some tape formats like Hi8. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. Right. All right. Um, yeah. So. How do you digitise high eight tapes? You know, uh, like these formats where the cameras don't aren't even around anymore. So we had to find kind of new for old cameras on eBay, and so we could digitise these tapes. You know, yeah. it's that miracle of archival work. Yeah, and da and yeah. Darwin, like uh, Darwin's a very humid sort of um, tropical place in Australia, and. These weren't kind of um, kept in uh, world's best practice archival kind of conditions, let me tell you. Uh, A lot of magnetic clumping. Oh, oh yeah, shocking. <laughs> yeah. So, do we, we have another question? Over here? 
How's our time? Is do we have time for what? Okay. Yep. I, I just had a quick question about you know going into these communities. I was wondering, you know, over that period of time, did, did you face resistance from community members to you know uh, you know participating, and did you feel like you had an impact on that community, you know, um, as you were trying to observe and, and document? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was interesting. You had interviews with uncle and and aunt, et cetera. So. Yeah. Look, that's a good question. Um, first, firstly, there's a couple of parts to the answer. Firstly, Gorimor was a co-producer, so um, the the scenes with the um, uh, both his parents' funerals were organised by him. Um, so, and and his nephew's uh, uh, Dupi uh, uh, ceremony as well, his initiation ceremony. So. Um, that that was um, that was quite easy, uh, but we we'll also really came in on the um, on the skirt tails of Skinny Fish Music, who had a uh, like a fifteen year relationship with the community. Mark had lived there for twelve years. His his wife Michelle, who doesn't appear in the film, um, was a nurse. Uh, at the clinic there for about that same time. So very well established and well known kind of uh, figures in the community. So we didn't really have a problem uh, except for one time uh, where another uh, program uh, in Australia, this sho shocking uh, program um, by a national broadcaster, SBS, had this show called, I think it was called First Contact. Called First Contact. First yep. Contact, right. And basically it took, uh, what do you call it, Red Dinks? Yeah, you'd call it Rednecks here. It's kind of like a reality show. With oh, so so, so taking redneck Austra racist redneck Australians uh, in to have their worst prejudices confirmed or uh, reappraised. Okay, um, so they went to uh, uh, Galawinko and um, you know. Um, depicted it in completely the opposite way that I did, where it's just this dysfunctional, dirty, horrible kind of place. Um, and when it was shown on uh, TV, that the community at um, um, Gallowinka were just really, 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 really angry. And we were out there and for some reason it got kind of mixed up. They thought we were from SBS. So we got hauled through um, the absolute mire for a day um, with some of the elders. I went, come on, we're doing this thing about Gurum, well, it's different, we've been out here, and this, 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 that. And it was a really, the, the, the project was kind of in the balance for a while until um, Gurum and uh, Jonga and Susan and a couple of others sort of sorted it out, um, saying that, yeah, we weren't that other film crew. Yeah. So I think this can be um, our last question, correct? Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, uh, first, I want to know if there's distribution in the US for this. And uh, I'm kind of curious to know if you had any difficulty resisting like the four hour cut of this movie with this kind of, <laughs> you must have a lot of material and it's a, it's a deep subject. And, I, and additionally, I kind of wondered if, uh, if you could talk about your, how do you do, chose to translate and not translate the various sections of, of indigenous language? Um, okay, the last one's a really great question. The question is really interesting, sort of, uh, I'll explain it. It's kind of one of my kind of favorite things about the film. Um, we don't have US distribution. We've got international distribution um, through Cinefil. Um, Can you just clarify, does that mean you have international distribution that excludes the U.S. or includes them? Well, if, if a U.S. Um, exhibitor or distributor wants it, they go through them and, and, yeah, but we haven't had that yet, unfortunately. Um, we'd like it, though. Um, we'll any distributors in the audience, um, um, come and see me. Um, okay, so one of the things that I came to realise uh, making this film uh, was the idea, and I, I called it in my own head, of untranslatability. All right. um, so you're looking at languages uh, with a similar cultural canon, for example, um, French and English, um, 
uh, French and um, French and German, e even ones that have a like quite distinct um, like linguistic root, like like uh, like uh, Finnish or Hungarian and, and English. You share a cultural canon, so you have a, a, a work of literature and you know a Finnish work of literature. It's not an enormous step. You can have a translator. Two translators would translate the same work, and it would be it would be roughly the same. In the same sense would sort of come across. Uh, what we found is with when we'd have these uh, lyrics translated uh, that he would be referring to something as a single word that is understood to be something in your matter. You know, or, or any, be it his mother language, um, Galpu, or his father's la language, um, Gumach. Uh, but it, it, it just it just did not fit in a sensible way into uh, English without quite literally a page of uh, linguistic notes and another page of anthropological notes of explanation. So one word would mean it would be a um, it would be a dream time um, place. It would be also be a dream time figure. It would also sort of um, relate to Gurumul through his father's clan. Just to be clear, so dream time's like an English translation of ancestral legacies that are that are all around these ceremonies and form the backbone of the songs. Yeah. You know, just yeah. yeah. So, so in you know one of his most famous songs, a Gurumul history, when he goes into, you know, um, you know, he's talking about I was born blind. I I I, I don't know why uh, in English. I don't know why. Um, you know, God bless me. So okay, we get that. But in the chorus, he's saying, you know, I am, and it's like uh, one of his ancestors. And it's like, uh, well, it's like. Uh, uh, you put that up. It's I. I am uh, Jukalu. What? 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 What, 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 do, what does that sort of mean? So we could only really do that a few times in the film where uh, it uh, touched upon like the simple to translate poetics of of their language. So he's saying, you know, um, uh, I am. A, I am. A rainbow serpent. I am this thing. So you can, I can, I, I can get it. Particularly when we link it in with what Susan was saying, right? And this sort of fantastic simile she has, um, or when he's talking about his um, father's death and beloved father, and you know the sun setting, and a couple of things where the simile is really kind of simple. So initially we had we had translation through all of it, and people were just thinking, oh, well, what does that mean? And well, yeah, so. Untranslatability. Who knew there was such a thing? You think that you think that uh, we all share the sort of uh, same cultural canon, but we, we just don't. Yeah, and it just—it's really important to know that sometimes we can't just get other people's knowledge like that. And in a way, this is like the perfect real abilities film because what we always say is we really want films. Well, all the films are perfect real abilities films, but we always want films when the issue of a person's disability isn't necessarily the centerpiece of the film, but an important resonance throughout. And um, you've just given us a wonderful gift, and we uh, thank you so much. And this film has been all over New York. You've been all over New York. Haven't gotten lost once. Well. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to uh, Nighthawk in Brooklyn and Maisel's up in the Bronx and downtown at NYU and other places. So thank you once again. So please join me in thanking Paul for this amazing film. And please thank Faye for the wonderful job.